Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a land where joy should never end. I'll fly away, oh, I'll fly away, oh, glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Welcome to 2448 Toto. I am so excited to have you here. Let's uh, let's kick the show off. Let's go. So your company is Martin's Grading and Excavating. Martin Grading and Excavating. Tell me a little bit about what that company is and what it does. What it is is we do, we're a full service grading company. I'm also a North Carolina licensed septic installer. We do lot clearings, small grading around the house, fixing house sites. We'll clear a house site where you can build your new house on it. We'll do a septic install. We also do septic repairs, fix driveways, do ditch work, put in culverts. So you if basically it got works with the dirt. We do it. Every kid's dream is to it's go exactly drive a tractor right. and tear up yards and <laughs> make things happen. Yep, we tear everything up, make a big mess, and then I make it all pretty again. That is awesome. Why'd you get into doing this sort of work? It's all I've ever really done. Oh, really? Before I was ever a fireman, right out of high school, I worked for a grading company. My best friend's dad owned a very large grading company in Lake Toxway. So I was 14 years old working for a grading company. Before that, we had a grading, we had a tractor with a, a little Just Kubota. your family or whatever? Yeah, my dad had a little Kubota tractor with a backhoe on it. I was six, seven years old. I would get home from school. I would go get the keys to the tractor, go down there in the backyard and dig up a hole. <laughs> That's awesome. One of my first memories that I can really remember with the track with the backhoe, we were going to my dad's mom's. And they had, we had a garden up here, and all the water ran off the hill. Mm -hmm. We had to, and it would run toward the house. So they always kept a ditch around the top of the hill below the garden. Yeah, well, it had got filled up over the years, and Daddy took a tractor over there and stuck me out there on it. And he was doing stuff in the yard, and his mama, bless her heart, she wasn't. She was just a little woman, a little big <laughs> woman. She said, "You can't let him be on that thing. He's too young." He said, "Mama, he's better on that thing than I am." That's awesome. So you were just natural at the tractor. I always learned it. That's all we were ever. That's all we were ever around with tractors, equipment. That's pretty cool. Did you grow up in kind of a rural area? For folks that are on the some listeners of the podcast don't know our region very we, well. We are. We're a very rural area. I mean, you can go from a housing development to two hundred acres of empty land. Yeah. And then three hundred acres of farmland right beside it. So that's we're awesome. very rural. Yeah. It's growing up now, which is good for my business. So that allows me to go in and do those house sites, but. It used to be very rural, small, net community stuff yeah. like that. Tell me about how you kind of, on your on your first tractor tractoring experience, like what was it like the first time you drove a tractor or worked on one of these things, something like that? We were doing, it's like a golf learning center in Lake Toxway. Yeah. We were doing the finish grade on it. So the first thing I ever did was I got on a skid steer and was leveling dirt from piles that they were hauling in to fill up this hole yeah so i would get in there and knock those piles down while them dump trucks would haul dirt and that's the first real thing i ever did in a grading business that's and awesome. then i got stuck on a 1978 john deere 750b long track dozer <laughs> it wouldn't turn you couldn't turn but right on the thing because the left <laughs> steering clutch was bad and if you turn to the left it would kick the track off oh that's not good so you had to go if you wanted to turn to the left you had to turn a complete circle <laughs> So I learned how to run a dozer on an old wore out piece of junk. That's so funny. Well, how old were you when this was like, when you were learning this stuff? 13, 14. Really? Tell me about this friend of yours. Like what was how did you get hooked up with these guys? I it's funny. I got hooked in with Kyle and Carmen because we joined the Ottawa Fire Department as juniors. Okay. So I was fourteen. So it relates to the fire service somehow. It, it relates back to the fire service yeah. because he joined the fire department. I had known them. My dad graduated high school with Carmen, so I knew of them. They lived oh, yeah. in Ottawa. A good friend of ours on the fire department where I grew up. My dad, a little backstory. My dad's been on the fire department since 1988. That's awesome. So, Alan, who was a fireman at Etowah, worked for Carmen. He drove dump truck for Carmen. <laughs> so, when I joined Etowah, I'm, I'm two years older than Kyle. Okay. When I joined Etowah, it was right in the middle of the summer. Alan said, hey, do you want to come work for us? We need some 
just general help, general labor. We need help. Yeah. He said, yeah, I'll come work for you. He said, Carmen will pay you $10 an hour, yeah. which was good, decent money in 2010 or yeah. 2000 <laughs> for a 14-year-old kid Yeah. to go play on equipment. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Sounds great. So that's how I got to meet Kyle. Well, he joined the fire department two years later because they lived there in Etowah as well. He joined the fire department, and we just became great friends. So I worked for his dad all the way up till 2008 when the economy tanked. Yeah. When the economy tanked, we lost work. Yeah. We wound up, worked right up here. We got into a contract job with a communications company putting fiber optic in. They had a big mm. company out of Canada come in. It's called the Spider Plow. We plowed Google Fiber down the side of the road. Down We actually were on Highway 64. We went from Statesville, just above Statesville, toward Lenore, all the way down to uh, Charlotte, mm. plowing it down the side of the road. Well, that run, that contract run up. Yeah. Did a little bit more traveling for work. All that dried up, so I went to work for a stream restoration company. Interesting. Still tractoring. Still running a track hoe. Yeah. Went to work with them. We contracted to them. We did that for like eight months. Yeah. Living in Moore. I was staying in Mooresville in a hotel room. For, oh, wow. We would go down there for two weeks and then come home for like four days. Oh, wow. And then go back. Hmm. We did that and then worked right up completely. Yeah. It, right in the beginning of 2000, right in the middle of 2009. Yeah. Everything went to pot. Interesting. You could there was you couldn't buy grading work anywhere around here. There was a lot of companies that went belly up. Interesting. So were you kind of... You mentioned you were a fireman. Were mm-hmm. you cross-trained in that role, or was that a career for you at that time, or was that just something you did? I was doing it. I was strictly a volunteer fireman when I was at home, run calls. I started obtaining my firefighter one and two certificates when I in 2004, when after I graduated high school. Yeah. I actually got my EMT while I was still in high school. That's I was Because awesome. I turned 18 in March. They had a class. You had to be 18 to take the state EMT test. Yeah. Well, we graduated. We finished our EMT class at, like, the end of March. Yeah. So I had just turned 18, took my EMT test, did that, worked on my firefighter one and two certificates, got all that. It actually took me like 12 years to do it as a volunteer because you could only go to a weekend school when yeah. you were available. Yeah. Because everybody run academies and classes at fire departments run it during the daytime. Well, we had to work. Yeah. So you'd have to do them at night or on the weekends and go all over the country trying to find classes. Yep. So I obtained that in 2000. 11 never really had the thought of being a fireman yeah full time yet i was still working in the grading business at that time when i grew when i finished my firefighter one or two i was working for the department of transportation in north carolina yeah running a running a machine driving a dump truck stuff like that then i left the dot in 2016 to drive a truck for u.s foods oh interesting no money yeah there was no money at the state it's because all the grading work had dried up and well and state budget was. cuts yeah the DOT is a very large cash cow. Mm. They don't make money. They spend money. <laughs> so when budget cuts come, they take it out of the DOT first. Interesting. Because okay. they don't they don't charge for doing the work. That's a good that point. Yeah, there's no revenue associated no, with it. No, we're doing, we're fixing road problems, fixing ditches, putting new pipes in. So, so taking taxpayer revenue from other parts of the city or the state. They actually get their tax the revenue from from your gas tax. So Really? The gas, when you put gas in your car, you get a certain amount of gas tax. Interesting. And charged in your gas price. That's what the DOT makes their money. That must be one of the big. Uh, what the heck is the story with all the electric cars here? Then like, I plug my thing in here. There's no gas tax on it. You're getting electric tax. Oh, um, really? So, so the Energy Commission gets your money. Interesting. That's wild. But I'm sure they'll come up with a way to charge for your electric vehicle. Too. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Well, tell me about. So I'm curious. You. Um, it sounds so blase. Like, oh yeah, I was in a fire service. I went to in high school. I was studying my EMT. That was such a foreign concept to me in high school. Mm-hmm. What was it that drove you towards the fire service as a lifestyle or as a culture? Or like, where did that even come in? I'm actually a third generation fireman. My great uncle was the first fire chief at Etowa Fire Department. Really? Grew up in Etowa. My dad. My dad was on the fire department from as long as I can remember. We've been tied in with emergency services since I was a little boy. He, yeah. he started as a volunteer fireman, and then in 1994, he went to work for the Henderson County Sheriff's Department as a 911 telecommunicator. Heard his voice many times. <laughs> Wish he would go back, because my dad gives great directions. Yeah. But he worked at the sheriff's office for 30 years. He quit, he retired, went home. Mm. So, at that point, 
I was still tied into the fire department. Yeah. I joined the fire department when I was 14 because we could join as a 14 as a junior member. And you'd always had that, in, like your granddad and yep. your dad had always we, been firemen. We had, I grew up around the firehouse because I can remember – my dad coming to pick me up on his days off, he would pick me up from the fire, from school in a fire truck or the van or the fire department pickup. <laughs> what did that feel he, like? It was great. People would look at you like, why is he coming in in a fire truck? Oh, his dad's a fireman. The blizzard of 93 hit. I was stuck at my grandparents' house in Brevard. My dad brought one of Etowah's service trucks, which is an old four-wheel drive Chevrolet truck. He drove it all the way to Brevard to get me and my two cousins from my grandparents' house That's awesome. and bring us home. Because we were snowed in up there. <laughs> yeah. Like three feet of snow. Nothing uh. would go. My mom was a nurse, so she was she was working at the nursing home at the time. Oh, yeah. So she was stuck Snowed in there. Like, she couldn't yeah. go nowhere. She was stuck. Daddy was with the fire department. So they finally, like three days later, he finally was able to get up there to get us That's and wild. bring us home. What's it like? I feel like that culture of like growing up in a household where public safety is such an instrumental part of the – I don't know what it is. Like just the culture is like, that's gotta be different to like, no one in my family was a firefighter. No one was anything. Mm-hmm. And so for me to come home and tell stories, people were like, that's like so foreign, but I feel like it'd be a, such a unique upbringing to have folks that are in that space. And I just wonder what, if you can reflect on it, what was it like having that history and having that access? It was always something that my dad was proud of being able to go out and help the community mm-hmm. in their time of need. He loved to help people. My dad is a huge talker. You've met my daddy. My daddy will talk. He will talk to a brick wall and get an answer from it. Because it will talk back because it'll get tired of hearing him talk. Yeah. But he loves people. My dad loves people. He loves to help people. Yeah. He would rather go out and help somebody as he would do anything else. Interesting. So I grew up with that public service, community service knowledge and base my whole life. Yeah. And what better way to do it? Then go to the fire department where you can, you're volunteering your time, you're helping somebody, yeah, and doing something good for the community. That's pretty. Plus, cool. you get to do fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely of all the things you can volunteer to do. I feel like it's okay. I got to go blow the air horn and do the siren. Sure, sometimes people are sick, but it's part of the gig. You That's know? right. <laughs> what was the schooling like? It, it's it's uh, very North Carolina to me because I didn't grow up in North Carolina. But when I think about like. In high school, like maybe we had home ec or maybe we had like a shop class, but there's no way there was an opportunity to go learn to be an EMT or fire academy in high school. What was that like? We didn't even have those classes at school. That I went oh, on really? my own to go get EMT. Oh no, I, was, I figured that was in school or something. Oh no, I was in high school. I would take my I would take my regular high school classes, get off from school. We had class at Blue Ridge Community College from six to ten, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And oh, every wow. other Saturday. So it was like instead of sports, you were in fire academy. Mm-hmm. I played golf in high school. <laughs> nice. That's I mean, awesome. I, I was I played golf in high school. My grand my grandfather was a big golfer. No way. I always learned how to golf, so I played golf on the golf team in high school. And now you build golf courses. Funny how the whole world. Goes. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny because we redid. That was one of the projects I worked for with Carmen. We redid Lake Toxaway Country Club. We did a complete golf course renovation up there in 2007. That's pretty cool. It's fun. Yeah. But we. We would go to school, and then I would get off and then go to get my EMT class. Mm. So I was studying for high school, trying to graduate high school, plus finish my EMT Interesting. at a college. What did you think was, like, some people love it, some people hate it. What did you think about EMT school? I enjoyed it. It was something different. Mm. You were actually hands-on learning how to plug a bleeding wound, fix a broken bone, restart somebody's heart. That was something that just intrigued me. Yeah. And as you know, being in the fire service, what are 80% of the calls that we run? Yeah, they're medical calls. Medical calls. Exactly right. So if you don't have any kind of medical background, what good are you going to do? for stand around and watch. <laughs> yeah. Twiddle your thumb. Were you a uh, good student or what, what What do you think about I was school? an average student. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I, was a C, I was a C average student. I hated high school. Hated it. Hated it with a passion. Interesting. So hated it, but still did average pretty I good. I did decent. Yeah. I mean... I graduated with like a 3.0. That's pretty good. I mean, Better than I, I was, got. <laughs> I was not. I was not going to go to college. Oh, really? Okay, so you didn't go to college. Did nope. high school, fire academy, and then started a business. Yep. Bingo. I love it. That's exactly what I did too. So <laughs> that's cool. What was um as you got out of school? What was your first fire service experience like? Were you you were in the juniors? I was a junior. I was spent from 2000 to 2004 as a junior. 
Once you but once you graduated high school and were eighteen years old, then they would move you to a senior fireman. What's the difference between those roles? Junior fireman, you're more or less a gopher. You learn what's on the trucks, you learn how to do the job, but you actually can't go in and fight fire until you're eighteen years old. Can you ride along? You can ride. We rode. I rode calls. We would direct traffic on wrecks. Oh yeah. We directed traffic. We would if it was a structure fire, we would go. Go get me this. Go get me a tool. Go get me this fan. Go get me a Halligan bar. Go, oh, yeah. Go pull this line. Stand out here at the front door and <laughs> shove this line in the house for these boys. Yeah. So we learned all of that. Yeah. We still got to do training burns. We were able to go in and see fire. Play with, be able to, in a controlled environment. Sure. Put a fire out. Learn how to run a fire extinguisher, stuff like that. So that's that four years as a junior is what gave us the knowledge base to be a senior fireman. Interesting. And then from a senior fireman, when you get to do, you get to be an interior firefighter. So you once get, you graduate, then you get into it all that stuff. You get to go do all that fun stuff. That's awesome. What was your um, first call? Do you remember? I don't remember what my first call as a junior was. I can remember my first major call as a senior fireman. It wasn't even in our district. I drove up on a horrible wreck. Mm. Both, it was a double fatality. Oh, they no. were in a Corvette and they had flipped with the t tops open. Oh no! So. It had killed them, and I drove up around the curve as this car was finishing its last flip. Oh, and I was wow. like, oh, God, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, you didn't even have it's your like, crew uh, with you. Uh, what, what do I do? I don't know what to do with my hands. So then it kicks in, fireman mode. All right, got to check on them, see, check, check vital signs, check on people. Yeah. And that's where it started. That was one of my first. I was barely 18. Really? And it just changed over from a junior to a senior. Did you already have a radio and you had access to mm-hmm. getting to people? It was on the actually way in Transylvania County, so I had a radio. Oh, wow. So I jumped on their channel. I had to thumb through the radio because <laughs> yeah. at the time we didn't have the display screen. Oh, it was just old school channels. Motorola MT1000. <laughs> it was 16 channel radio. We had a cheat sheet that was laminated, m- mounted to the battery on that thing. It told you channel one was jump off, channel two was. Oh, so you had to know where you were so you could get to the closest tower. Uh-huh. Interesting. So how do you call that one in? You just call them and say, hey. I, <laughs> I just called in and said, Edouard Carr, 1648 to OCD. I'm on scene of a rollover NBA Rosman Highway. near. I think I was near Frozen Creek Road. Crazy. And then they come on down and mm-hmm. helped out. What was that like, you know, afterwards? I think that so often, I'll get back to talking about excavating too, but I'm curious, like afterwards, the, I, I remember my first fatality wreck. It was hard to be a first call and a first fatality wreck, mm-hmm. but when you, like you have to decompress that, and it's like, holy cow, like I've trained for this, but it still is a big dang deal. You got to go, We, I wound up going back to the firehouse after, because I was on my way to work. Oh, in yeah. In Okay. So we talked about it up there. I kind of got everything off my chest. Yeah. And then come back to the firehouse, talk to it, some of the seasoned guys that were actually working, talk to them a little bit about what was going on. Yeah. They helped me through a lot of that stuff. That's good. What was your – you were going to work on the grading stuff mm-hmm. then? So what was your relationship with the fire service like while running this or working in this, in this grading business? When you're – I mean, I was 40 miles from the house. Yeah. But, like, Toxaway Fire Department is up there as well. Yeah. Carmen was a member of Lake Toxaway. So he was a firefighter. So he was a firefighter up there because they didn't have no help at the time. It was a small community. So we would leave a job site, get in his pickup truck, drive to a fire call, (laughs) and then go back and get on a machine grade. Yeah. That's so funny. I think that it's like there are certain types of businesses where when the business leaders are familiar with what the fire service is Mm -hmm. like, where it's like, go, you got a house on fire, go, go put it out. You know, it's like, that's the job. Because when I worked for the state, it was like, oh, well. Yeah, you don't get to do that. <laughs> yeah, you, interesting. You, you're here. You you sold your soul from seven thir- from seven to three thirty. Yeah, interesting. So tell me about the uh, the transition into from from volunteer fire service from high school, then in kind of your first jobs. When did you start feeling like you know I kind of think business might be for me? Well, it's funny because I didn't really think of ever starting a business on my own, especially a grading business. Really. I had no real ambition to say, oh, I'm going to be a paid fireman and I'm going to make a grading business for myself. Yeah. Never really had that ambition. We bought a house in 2000, early 2020 hmm. that needed a bunch of work. I needed to have a bunch of trees took down, yard needed to be regraded, stuff like that. Yeah. So I priced renting a machine. It was going to be... For, I was going to rent the machine for like four months because we had a bunch of trees took down. I needed to do a bunch of work in between me working. Yeah. 
So I was going to rent the machine for like four months. Well, it was going to be like $25,000 to rent this machine for four months. Yeah. I was like, well, if I'm going to spend this kind of money in a rental, I can put another $10,000 with it and go buy a machine. Yeah. And then I've got one to do whatever I want to do. Yeah, whenever you want. Rent it for well, life. Whenever I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. If I need to go dig a hole over here, I've got a machine, I'll go dig a hole. I can fix my yard, fix my dad's yard, do whatever I need to. Yeah. We, I took care of everything I needed at the house. Well, people started figuring out, oh, you got a machine. Why don't you come over here? I need this pipe replaced. I need a d- ditch dug. Can you come level me out a spot and put on a patio? So I started doing work. Yeah. Didn't have Primarily a, like side gig. Just like, side gig, just yeah. off the off the record. Here, yeah. pay me 400 bucks. I'll come yeah, just fix something your yard. To do. Yeah. Instead of that machine sitting there idle, it could at least pay for its fuel. Yeah. So I kept getting phone calls, getting phone calls. We had a couple of bad storms come through in the spring. Well, I put it on Facebook, said, hey, if you need storm cleanup, driveway's washed out, I've got a machine, give me a call. That's funny, yeah. And it so worked. I started picking up business. Well, at this point, it's late 2020. No, I actually bought the house in 2019. It's July of 2020, and I'm making enough money that you can't hide that much money from the government anymore. <laughs> I mean, you're yeah. getting four and five thousand dollar checks from people. It's like, hey, yeah, I can't hide taxes. this, so I've yeah. got to do something. Yeah, I was like, well, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna jump both feet, knee deep. Let's build a business, get insurance, no get way. workers comp. How did, was anybody in your family has traditionally business people, or had you done that before? No, nope. nobody. Random. Everybody, all my all my people have always worked a nine to five job. Interesting. My great my dad's dad worked for a concrete plant building concrete blocks. My grandfather, my mom's my mom's dad, worked at Dupont in Brevard. He worked for Dupont for thirty seven years. Oh wow! So everybody worked a, a traditional, very traditional job. Yeah, yeah. Dad worked at the sheriff's office. He before that he worked at Steelcase building furniture, office furniture. Yeah. My mom was a nurse, so she worked a strict schedule. Yep. So I, I'm the first one to ever really start a business. What was my that dad process? mowed grass yeah. on the side. But was it side cash like yours? It was just side cash. Before. He mowed grass on his days off from the sheriff's office, so just yeah. to give him a little spending money. Yeah. What was, how, I mean, you know, how did you go? I can think of mentors in my past where I was like, hey, you know, set up an LLC, do whatever. And it wasn't, it wasn't as foreign as if I had nobody in my, in my family life circle that had done business. Mm-hmm. How did you figure out what to do or take the first steps? I actually wound up talking to Carmen. And Kyle, but he had already done it, so he gave me the pointers on, you need to fill out this paperwork, you need to contact these people. Here's what you need to fill out on the paperwork. If you need some help, let me know. So you guys were kind of connected through the fire service mm-hmm. at that point, and it's like, hey, I'm going to do this. What was the hardest thing about starting the, the not the legal, I guess is a weird word, but the, maybe that's the right word, the legal side of the business, like the paperwork side. What was the hardest part about that? Trying to figure out exactly what the state of North Carolina wants on their paperwork. Uh-huh. You filled out the Secretary of State papers <laughs> trying to figure out just exactly what they want because the first time we did it, my name was spelled wrong. Oh, They spelled it A-R-R-O-N <laughs> instead of A-A-R-O-N. So I had to go back and refile all that. And then you've got to have, to start your business, you've got to have your articles of incorporation. That was probably the most difficult thing that I've ever done. Did you write it or did you have someone else draw it up? Uh, Janae wrote it. Really? I, I'm, yeah. She she had an English background, so I did not. Have, Janae is Tedo's wife and works in our accounting department, by the way. So <laughs> we love Janae. <laughs> it's she was able to write all that, but you had to. I actually took Kyle's and looked at his to see what the articles of incorporation were. Yeah, because he actually used his dad's. <laughs> That's awesome, like a living, breathing, passed yep. down document. It was just you, know? you had to look at it to see what they wanted. Yeah, and then fill it out. Interesting. And with the Secretary of State, there's not really a defined grading section. Yeah. It's either landscape design or hardscapes or road construction. Yeah. So you've got to find the the line in between those to fill out that paperwork. Interesting. Yeah. So when you got it going, what were your first couple of steps? I feel like, you know, the it's so funny. People think like, okay, now I've, I've got an LLC. I've got my business set up. Now I'm in business, and then it's like almost an anticlimactic start because then it's like, oh, now I got to actually fill the bucket with jobs and revenue and all these yep, things. Now I've got to make money. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I now then, 
you've got to make the money. So I took to Facebook real hard in the very beginning. Okay. I would market my, I would, every, every post that somebody would put on a Facebook marketplace or on a, one of the yard sale web pages. Hey, I need somebody to come do some work. Here's my name. Here's my number. Here's my business. Give me a call. I'd love to come give you a free quote. That's awesome. We try to keep our prices lower because I still work a full-time job at the fire department. So Yeah. But ultimately, I've still got business payments, but we try to keep a very competitive price. And that's how I started, was off of Facebook. Just, hey, I see a post. Let me answer this yep. thing and see if there's I got some do. work that way, and then I was contacted. It was once you sign up for LLC and you're a grading business and people start seeing you post on Facebook, you get all these business calls. Yeah. One of them was from Home Advisor before Angie's List bought them out. Oh, yeah. So Home Advisor, you want to be a professional for us. List you on our website. You pay for the leads. You We'll call you. You pay for it. You get the work. Yeah. So I signed up for that. And I gained a lot of business. Really? Of so it was advisor. worthwhile. I mean, you, we have to pay for the leads. So if sure. you, you put your information in, it's free for you as the homeowner. You put your information in. Oh, I need a house lot cleared. Well, you type all that information in, what you want, it sends it to Home Advisor. They kick it back to their professionals, and you get a phone call. You answer the phone, gives you the details and a number to call back. You call them, talk to them, and then you set up a time to go meet them. Interesting. So is it expensive per lead, or is it not so bad? Depends. Huh. It depends on the different type of grading or what you're working on. So it's qualified Some, based on what they said. So if they said that they need their lot cleared, that's ultimately going to be a larger paying job, so they charge you more for that lead. Interesting. You're that's usually so anywhere weird. per lead from forty to one hundred and fifty bucks. Oh, so it's not cheap. I mean, it's not no. like a dollar or three dollars. <clears throat> Interesting. So as you do that, then you would call. Did you have pretty high success in closing business from those things? I'm probably closing. It, I would say it's a seventy percent. Really? Oh, wow. Sixty to seventy percent because that's so funny. You get a lot of tire kickers. Yeah. Off of Home Advisor or people that you get a lot of misqualification, but that's where Home Advisor will step in. Can you be like, hey, these guys are not looking well. Yeah. I paid for this lead, but it's not what. And they will give you your refund back, but you you still have to show. They have to see that you made contact. Yeah. Within a twenty four hour period. To get your money back, so you've got to be diligent about answering the phone and calling these people back. Yeah, but there's a lot of tire kickers. There's a lot of people that just don't know what they want. Yeah. Well, so when you do that sort of work, I mean, that's that's an interesting model where like Facebook Marketplace outbound. You're you're seeing stuff come in and you're mm -hmm. reaching out and calling people versus an, like an Angie's List or a Home Advisor. You know, in our business, we always get calls people trying to sell us like, oh, here's a business card size to add and a magazine no one reads. And I found that. Those types of solicitations early on in our business were like cash flow crippling mm -hmm. because they didn't, they never gave us the, like no one actually read a business card side ad and then bought a $2,000 brow light. Yep. It was like, there was never a conversion, but it's cool to hear that like, they're not all scams. Like though, like if that sounds like it worked, that sounds that, like it works great. The one that I get, the business call I get, I probably get it five times a week. Hi, there's an open spot on the, we can list your business at the front page of Google. Oh, we get the same calls like all the we time. We will list you in the top page of Google. We see that there's only three grading companies. Do you know these people? I know them. Yeah. But I'm not paying you what you want. Yeah. Because those companies are like $1,200 a month. And most of them are a scam. Most of them are not, because it, they're not Google. You can't pay them. To Town Square Interactive, Ollie Ollie are the ones that I get all the time. That's so funny. Yeah, you know, it's like, as we've learned and grown, I remember early on people would call and I'd be like, oh, well, I guess I have to do this in order to be able to compete. Okay, I'll do it. And now I'm like, screw you guys. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not listing. I'm not buying a business card size ad. I'm not paying you to do something you can't do on Google. That's right. But you almost have to like, you know, when you get in the boxing ring the first time, you're pretty likely to get punched in the face. Sink Once or swim. Yeah, if you've been in the boxing ring a while, that, that experience lets you know, you know, this is not actually worthwhile. And I don't care how much money you spend in marketing. You can spend $100,000 in marketing, but nothing will ever pay off any better than word of mouth advertisement. Interesting, yeah. That's true. Especially in grading and in, in doing dirt work. Because it's like doing people grading work. So if I go do a job for you, yeah. and I do a great job, and one of your friends says, hey, I think we're going to regrade our yard. Like, hey, I've got a guy that does that did my yard. He did amazing. Here's his number. Call him. Mm. Th that is how I've... We've built that clientele, too, That's good. where you're getting a lot of word of mouth. I think that there's value in that. If I put myself in those shoes or in that situation, and, like, for instance, we're going to regrade our driveway mm -hmm. or whatever, 
I could call 50 companies, get a bunch of quotes, or like I can call you and say, hey, I know you do good work. I know Janae. Well, let's do yep. this. Like, can, can you come do our driveway? I'm less likely to even shop it. I actually don't even care what the other three quotes are because as long as I feel like whatever you told me is fair, yep. then go do the work. I trust you. And I think trust in the secure community, it's like if I trust you and you trust someone else, then I can trust someone else. Yep. And, and not always, but like I hear them always talking about like that chain of trust. And word of mouth advertising is so funny because – if I can trust the, like if someone tells me I should trust you, especially in the fire service, it's the mm -hmm. same way. It's like new recruit comes in first day of the job and you're like, who the hell is this guy? Where'd you come from? Do you know the place they used to work? Like, Hey, what do you think of this guy? Now nah, he's good. Yep. All right. Boom. Now you're like, all right, off the races. Well, and that's the thing you get, you start and that was how I started off doing work for other firemen. Yeah. So it was like, Hey, you got a track. Oh, come fix this for me. So you start with that clientele base. So you get a clientele base of people that you know. Yeah. And they can start referring you to people that you don't know. <laughs> yeah but you've got to there's a there's a line where you ultimately have to do some kind of marketing yeah because word of mouth around here is small there are a lot of grading companies around here oh, okay Interesting. yeah there's a lot of grading companies but there's a lot of work around here yeah it's like you've got more and son who does very large scale contracting mm. so if i call them ask them to grade my driveway they're gonna be like no way i'm not doing that they're gonna give you a ridiculous price to come in here and build you a driveway because they're building subdivisions. They're yeah. putting in roads for subdivisions. They're doing large site contracting. Yeah. It's like LNS that did Mills River Fire Department. They are a large grading contractor. Yeah. So doing a multi acre, huge earthwork site is their average deal. Whereas mm -hmm. another business might be like, I'm looking for whatever job I can pull in. So yeah, this driveway job is a big enough job for me. It's worth the time. Yep. Yeah. They're not going to come out and regrade your yard because you've got water running into your basement. Yeah. They're going to give you a ridiculous price on that stuff because they don't want to screw with it. Do you ever work with those companies to be like, hey, for the stuff you don't want to quote, like here's... I have talked to several of those companies say, hey, y'all are bigger. I know y'all get a lot of calls like I do. If you don't want to do it, give me a call or tell them to call me. I'll be glad to go do it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like so often, like you would give someone a, like a... You know, they call it F you money. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. if you'll pay me that much. I'll say, screw it. I'll do it. Yep. But it's not worth it. Oh, yeah. I would wish someone would just tell me, like, I'm like, it's not worth my time. My business is structured for that. And we have in, in the fire tech brand, it's funny because we have, it, it doesn't, uh, I don't mean to dimin diminish the value of some companies, but there are guys that are like very small, mm -hmm. like one man band. They install lights sometimes out of the garage, but it's really a hobby. It's like not full business. And there's like dealerships that have, to outside sales reps and overhead and capital and like all these facilities. And we don't love one more than the other, but the amount of effort that it takes to support them, we put in place these distributors that handle their regional group of the yep. smaller companies. And I feel like there should be a distribution model for like the grading world or something. Cause that'd be so helpful. It would be, a, it would be helpful, but yeah. it is such a competitive market. So they don't want to give up that. Or they don't want to give up that. Nobody wants to give up that competitive market. And that's like I tell a customer, I will give you a quote. They said, well, we're going to get some other bids. Feel free. Yeah. That keeps me in check. So yeah, if I true. know, if I come back and my price is a little high and they say, oh, we've got the same, we've got this company that's going to do it for a little bit cheaper, go ahead and go with them. That's fine. It's not going to hurt my feelings. Next time you bid it, though, Next you time you bid it, I can, I can maybe be a little more aggressive in pricing. Yeah. But where I'm different than most of those large companies, I don't have the overhead operating expense. Yeah. Most of my machines are paid for in cash. I own, I have a Traco that's sitting on a trailer right here in the yard Can't wait to see this that thing. is financed and a truck that's pulling the Traco financed. Yeah. Everything else is paid cash. I worked up enough money working, starting out, that I bought my first Traco, a skid steer, and a triaxle dump truck paid cash for. No, so you're not really like a slave to the bank. If you wanted to slow down a little or you want to speed up a little bit. Yep. That's a, it's an interesting business model because I think in, uh, in our personal lives, we live a very strict, strict and structured budget. Mm -hmm. And, um, we study a lot under Dave Ramsey. And so a lot of like, he's like the anti debt guy, you know, but it's funny because if you can, and in our person, in our professional lives, you know, we balance you know, growth and capital and that sort of stuff. But when we, when we evaluate, do I want to finance something or do I want to buy something? It's nice to be able to buy stuff. And it's, what do they say? Patience is a virtue. Patience is a virtue. So use the small tool and build a little nest egg and then use the next size tool. I mean, this video studio we're sitting in, mm -hmm. when we started, we didn't have a video studio. And then when we bought this building, it was a nice, whoops, it was a nice camera, but it was a nice camera and a regular old table. And I just sat there and then we saved up some cash and it was like, 
was actually during COVID when they canceled up. <laughs> uh, they canceled FDIC, and so the yep. money I had already spent on FDIC, we got back. And we're like, well, for this amount of cash, we could build the studio and we own it. And so then we built the studio, and it's like now if the studio is wildly successful or it's not, because we paid for it, I, I don't feel like I'm such a slave to it. And you've already got it; it's paid for. Yeah. And so it's nothing out of your pocket now to yeah. have it up. I think about other guests that have been on the show, and sometimes like questions will come up about like, oh, you know, I. I I always want to, how do I be more financeable or how do yep. I, you know, I, I need to, do I need to acquire debt in order to grow my business? And sometimes it may make sense and sometimes it doesn't, but it is an interesting model where it's like, if you can do that and you can pay cash for stuff, it's worth, especially in the fire service. I love the fire service. It doesn't pay great, but it, I got full-time benefits if yep. I want it. It pays enough and then I can go start my business. But if you run the fire service long enough and you save well, then you can start a business and have a security blanket. Uh -huh. It's awesome. Well, and that's the big thing. I mean, I work a full-time job at the fire department. We work 10 days a month. My schedule conduces me to run a grading business. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be on the job site every day. Yeah. But I schedule my jobs around my days off. That's perfect. So we we don't – I know you offer the 2448 podcast. We don't work the 2448 schedule. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> I would hate it. We work What's a schedule you guys on? We work a modified LA. Oh, So we work a day off a day, work a day off two days. Work a day off a day, work a day off four. And then it just repeats. And it just repeats. Do so, you like that schedule? I love it. Because you get plenty of time off. You get, so it's like we're getting ready to go on vacation. Yeah. I took four shifts off, get two weeks off. That's awesome. Yeah. Because we just come off of our four days off. I'm actually off today, and I'll be off till the 27th. So we get a good two week. I can take four days off, get two weeks off. That's so great. I love the fire service for that deal. It's like you trade a couple shifts here and there and then yep. you're like, well, that's the thing I've, I've took four days off, but I only took two days of vacation. I've swapped two with some other guys. Yeah. Got one that's getting ready to have a baby. So he needs some time off. That's so awesome. I swapped a couple of days with him, swapped one, a guy I needed a day off back in the beginning of June. So I swapped with him. So he's paying me back next week. That's awesome. So we work it through yeah. where you don't always have to burn your vacation time. Yeah. I think that the um, there's there's all the I think locally they're doing the forty eight seventy two forty eight ninety six yeah it's it's funny how there's all these different shift schedules but the, you know that it's it's all about and maybe like the people that love the, whatever their schedule is mm -hmm. it's all about like okay what do I have to trade in order to be able to take an extended vacation and what I love about the fire service and this whole twenty four forty eight podcast celebrating entrepreneurs in the fire service is that so many people think of how can I still do my duty? How can I do the job of the firefighter? And how can I optimize so that I can go take that? I need two weeks to go do this big job. Let me mm -hmm. go do this giant job. I'll trade a couple. I'll work a little extra on the front side. And it's I such can, a unique I can thing. take a couple of days off here or swap a couple of days and get time off to where I can go do those jobs. Yeah. Because I wound up. Sometimes it's vacation, but sometimes it's working, too. We did it back in the, I did it back in the spring. I, had, I was doing a septic repair. We run into a horrible mess. We got into some old repairs that were illegal. So I had this man's yard dug up, and I was supposed to go to work the next day. Well, I had his yard dug up. His septic system was complete destroyed because oh, no. we had, had to go in and fix it. But they had ultimately what they had said, the line was here. Off of that line, they had dug a gravel pit and filled it full of pipe and gravel, <laughs> and that's where they were running it into. So the line had went bad. So we were putting in the lines, which I should have been done that day, get the inspection. And then you realize. And then we got into that digging that line. And I was like, I called the inspector. I said, we've got a mess. I said, you're going to have to come out here and look at it. We're going to have to fix it. I said, I can't put it through here. I said, this is an old illegal repair. Yeah. So we've got to adjust. What do you do in those situations if you're in a, well, I guess the two questions are, you're balancing your schedule. you got to work the next day. And two, I'm just curious in the septic world, when you see something that's not right, can you just say, oh, or you got to finish it? You've got to finish it. But that's where we lean on the county inspectors or the end the sole scientist engineer whoever you're working with so look we run into an issue what can we do to mitigate it and we wound up she come out the inspector come out we walked through everything i already had like 180 foot of line she was calling for 250 but there was no more room to put another line in below it because yeah. we were too close to our setbacks on property line because you've got to be so many feet off the property line with the septic system. You've got to be so many feet away from a road, so many feet away from a ditch. Yeah. There's all kinds of setbacks you've got to meet. Yep. So she's like, well, you've got 180 in. It's calling for 250. There's two people that live here. So so you're good with what you got since so you kind of worked the issue. So they worked it around. She's yeah. like, plumb it all together on what you got. Do away with this. Cover it and fill it. Yeah. 
So people You're can be reasonable, but it's kind of your job to understand what that looks like, yep. you know? How do you then balance that against, okay, now I got to do all this kerfufflery and I got to go to work in 12 hours? I picked up the phone and I called one of our guys who was actually working that day. I said, hey, man, I said, I need a huge favor. He said, yeah, well, what's up? I said, Russell, I need you. Can you swap with me tomorrow? I said, I'm in a hell of a mess. Yeah. I've got to have these days. He said, yeah, I'll swap with you. He said, because I need a day off later on. He said, <laughs> he said I'll swap with you. That's so awesome. He said, yeah, that'll work. I said, you sure? He said, yeah. He said, I'll get the paperwork out. He said, I'll fill the paperwork out. I said, I'll run by there this evening and fill it out. That's I'll awesome. sign my side what I need to so sign. So there's a process for doing we've got to do. We've got a shift swap paper. Yeah. We fill out who's I, I this person is going to swap with this person on this such day for this amount of hours. Yeah. So he swapped a full shift with me so I could go finish my job and get it completed for the homeowner and it worked out great yeah so it, there is a we ha, we have a real good working relationship with everybody that works with us that's really good but if it would have wound up we had enough people working that day i could have called in and say hey i've got to have tomorrow off and the fire and chief's good enough to like, be able to help hey we'll that. let you take off yeah or like hey i only need 12 hours let me let me take 12 hours vacation i'll be in at night Got it. Okay, so you could do some. Jockey. I can do a twelve hour. I can I can take eight hours off. I can take two hours off. Yeah, I love that in the fire service, at least here locally. I mean, in some districts, maybe not so much, but I feel like so often the industry, the firefighting industry, is one that is cognizant that businesses exist in the mm-hmm. part time and that it's supportive of it. It's not like yeah, you know, it sounds like DOT's like I don't care what the story is. This is what you got to work. Yep. But the fire service is. I think that the culture of the fire service, whether it's the fire chief or it's the other crewmates, like they understand the lifestyle that firefighters live. Most firefighters have a second job because you've got to have that second job. <laughs> Number yeah. one, you get to decompress. If whether you're mowing grass, raking a yard, doing grading work, you've got that gives you your time away from the fire department, not to think about the fire service at all. It gives you time to your decompress. I mean, I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna dig a hole. It's going to let me <laughs> great decompression. You sit there and just take your anger out on the machine. Yeah. If you're, if you've had a bad day, rough shift, you can get out there and just turn the radio up my track home <laughs> and just let it do its thing. Your own world. Yeah. And you just get out of that cycle and it helps you clear your mind. Yeah. But everybody's got a side gig. There's not many firemen that I don't know that don't have a mowing business installing Y'all's lights, like Brandon. <laughs> yeah. Brandon does installs. He does lights. He does mowing. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. Landscaping. They do grading work. I've got a couple of the guys at the fire department to work for me on their days off. They'll come help me for a day. That's so good. But you've got to have that second. You got to have that second amount of income because we make decent money, but we don't make. We're not out to get rich <laughs> off of it by yeah, no exactly. means. Exactly. So you've got to have that to boost your boost your boost yourself. In your bank account. Yeah, of course. It sounds like family is a really important part of your business and personal life. And it is. I mean, I know Janae here through work, and I've met your son, and obviously I know your dad through the fire department. When I think about, you know, like what I know of your story, I know it changed when your son was born. It did. How, what was that like? I mean, that's like an instrumental part of what I know. That was you. where it started, was when we had our son. I was working full-time driving a truck for a company here in Fletcher. I'd quit U.S. Foods, and I'd got offered a better job working for Ray Johnson Trucking. Good friend of mine, he run trucks. We were home. I was home every night, but I was spending 13, 14 hours in a truck because we would go all over delivering grain for dairy farmers, and then we'd bring sand back for concrete. So I would go. We would make a big loop. We would go to Statesville, Graham, North Carolina, hauling this grain, and then we'd jump down to either Lysville, North Carolina, and get sand and come back, or Monroe, or go to Columbia, South Carolina, and get sand and bring back to the concrete plants. Hmm. So I was on the road. I was home every night, but I was on the road 12, 13 hours. We had we had Landon. He's, and me and Janae got to talking. It's like, I want you to come off the road where you can be at home a little bit more. Well, it worked out perfect because Mountain Home wound up having an opening. Right? I mean, this is like something that you can't make up. We had landed on a Tuesday. I was contacted on Wednesday by Mountain Home. Hey, do you want to come work for us as an engineer? Let me talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So we had landed on a Tuesday. I was up here at Mountain Home on Thursday doing an interview and was hired that day. Was that your first time in professional fire service? First career? time I'd ever worked professional. I <laughs> no mean, way. I had worked a little bit of part-time at Mills River. Sure. Because back 2008, 2009, 
we used to only have daytime staff at Mills River. Mm. We didn't have anybody work weekends. They just worked nine to five Monday through Friday. So we would backfill the station on with the volunteers on the weekends. We made sixty dollars a day to work Saturdays and Sundays. That's awesome. So you made sixty dollars. You'd come in and work nine to four. Yeah. At the fire department just to have some weekend help during the day. And they paid us sixty bucks a day, which I mean it wasn't great money, but it was spending cash for you to go out and have something to eat on the weekend. Yeah. So then you got this job at Mount Home. They mm-hmm. hired you right after your son was born. Boom. Now you're Yep. So I started two weeks later. I'm transitioned from truck driver to fire department engineer in two weeks. That's cool. And I love it. Fire service has always been a big part. I love being a fireman. So I just was like, yeah, this would be a great job. Schedule. I knew the, I knew how the fire department worked because I've been <laughs> around it. So you work. You only work 10 days a month, so... Yeah. Like, yeah, I got plenty of time to be with my kid. What was appealing? Was it was it mostly a time related thing? That's benefits. What, it was benefits. Oh, interesting. The benefits because when I was worried driving a truck, I didn't have any health insurance. Mm. Didn't have any kind of life insurance. Didn't have no benefits. Mountain Home, you've got great benefits. We got a great benefits package. Life insurance, health insurance, vision, dental, whatever you need. You know it. They you name it, they cover it. Mm. That's cool. And if they don't cover it, they pay a percentage of it. I got into a big, not a big LinkedIn argument, a social media argument, right? With this guy that was like, the fire service is terrible because they don't take care of their people, blah, blah, blah. They don't pay them well. And I was like, I'm not going to argue that they don't pay people well, but I am going to argue that I think the fire service does take care of their people. Yes. Because if the fire service can provide those stabilizing things, like your benefits, like health and vision and dental and life insurance, all that stuff, then they have this shift schedule that allows such this vibrant entrepreneurial Mm -hmm. community. And it's like... Is it right to slave away all day and all night for the fire department and then slave away all day and all night in your personal life? I don't know, but I know that it's a unique pairing where when you're starting a business, for me, one of the hardest things to do was I couldn't offer insurances and benefits. Yeah. Like when it was just me and Kama, it was just no way. And so it was like finding firefighters that have that in their in their, you know, professional. You've already careers. got it in your background. Yeah, then you're like, hey, I can hire a firefighter here or there because they already have those things that are so hard as a business owner. And then your business grows a little bit. And whether you pull people from the fire service or you just your business naturally grows, yep. it's like a unique, perfect melding of two supportive structures for each other to have business flourish. Oh yeah, and I mean, we get health insurance. We get, I mean, and they can say what they want to about the fire department not taking care of you. I can go show you my benefits package to <laughs> yeah. prove to you otherwise. And it's done right. They match us at seven percent in a four hundred one k. Really? They pay me. They they provide me with one hundred and fifty thousand dollar life insurance policy covered by the fire department. Covered That's awesome. straight up. Yeah. They pay for a cancer policy for us. They pay for one of the other disabilities. It's long-term or short-term. I can't remember. One of them we pay 50%. The other one they pay 100%. They pay for vision, dental, health. That's awesome. Insurance, time off. We get ample time off. Yeah. Um, They even pay for fraud protection. Really? It monitors our credit cards and stuff like that. They pay for fraud protection. There's a whole list of stuff that they pay for or they pay part of. Yeah. What's that career helped you do in your personal life that you couldn't do before? It's allowed me to have more time at home to be with my son. Even even me having a job, I'm still home in the evenings to eat dinner at the house, play with my son. He comes to work with me sometimes. He'll ride to Traco. He'll ride to Skid Steer. Or he'll boss daddy around while daddy's out. (laughs) Laying a head wall or directing me, he'll he'll come out and boss. He is a cutie fine. I tell you what, I love that kid. That's cool. Well, tell me about what Janae, you know, because so for for some of our listeners, I don't know, Janae, work, she's here. She works uh-huh. in our county department, and uh, she's a vibrant member of our team. How did what did she think of starting the grading business? I always hear about like, oh, Toto's looking at tractors today. Oh yes, and well, she's that sort of thing. She was she was a little. She's like she is a hundred percent supportive in whatever I do. She said, if you want to do it, do it as long as we can afford it. Yeah. So I wound up, I would saved up enough money when we bought the house, made the down payment. Well, I had that money so stored back to buy my first machine, paid cash for it. That's great. It's like, well, okay. So now then you're making some money. So it flowed through. She said, as long as I can, long, and she, as long as she sees that we're making money, we're in good shape. As long yeah. as the bills are continuing to be paid. Yeah. So she's been a very big integral part of that. She's not going to take the credit for it, but she does. <laughs> she helps me with all my book work. Yeah. She, tax time, which is a bear. It sucks. I hate taxes. I hate everything about doing taxes. <laughs> yeah. I hate she helps me get all those paperwork in. She helps me get all those paperwork in order. Yeah. She helps me with getting bills and she's a computer guru. She's laid out all my 
invoicing, all my spreadsheets for invoices, quotes, receipts. She's laid all that out for me. She's built me all those spreadsheets where all I got to do is type it in because I can't type like she does. I'm, I'm a hunting pecker. <laughs> yeah. So she's got all that set up for me where, like a spreadsheet, I can put in a in an estimate. Yeah. For material, it'll total it all up, add the sales tax in for all the material, and it'll spit it out down here at the very bottom as a complete number. Here's your estimate. That's great. She's got all that, and she's smart like that. So I'm just a dumb old fireman. I can't figure <laughs> that out. So that's why – that's where she comes in. She does all my computer work. She does all the bike scenes. I just punch in the numbers in the computer and say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what it's going to take to do it. That's really cool. And her spreadsheet spits out my number at the bottom. How long after you started working full-time at Mountain Home did you start the grading thing? Was it right away? or were No, you it was two years. You? Oh, really? I started Mountain Home in 2018 full-time. Oh, wow. And we didn't. I started the business in August of 2020. So you had kind of spent some time stabilizing your career. Yep, I stabilized the career. Thing. And I was still working for when I first started as fire department. I was still driving for Ray some, and they, on my off days, he'd call me and say, hey, I need somebody to drive a truck today. Can you come run this load to Statesville and go get a load of sand and come back? Yeah. And it paid me the same as what it used to, so I was still making money <laughs> on yeah. top of that and still getting to drive a little bit. And Then I transitioned out of doing that because I was helping. I was starting to – we bought the house, so I had the grading stuff going on at the house, so I kind of quit working for him. And was doing stuff at the house and then people calling. So that's how we kind of transitioned from straightly fireman doing a little bit of side work for somebody else to fireman, me running a business, doing all my work on my own. Well, I love your entrepreneurial drive and your spirit. It sounds like it's been part of your ethos, working with people who are entrepreneurial, with people who care for the community, with family. And I think it's a really cool story and, and it's been great to hear it here on the show today. So I want to ask you if we... Number one, if you're in Western North Carolina looking for your services for track hoeing mm -hmm. and tractor and that sort of stuff, where would someone find you? You can look for me on Facebook. I haven't. We've been so dang busy. I haven't got to put up a lot on Facebook, but yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to pay my I'm gonna have to pay my computer guru <laughs> to put some stuff on Facebook and get that back on going. But you can look me up on Facebook. My numbers are on there. All you gotta do is call me. That's great. Email me. Send me a text message. Find me in person. I'm easy to get a hold of. That's awesome. And then if you had any parting wisdom for a firefighter who is starting a business, thinking of starting a business, interested in business, what would you share with them about your journey that's, that they should know? Don't. If you think you want to do it, bite the bullet and do it because it will pay off in the end. Because I was really apprehensive about starting it right in the middle of COVID when everything was just all screwed up. I was, like, I was am I sure I want to do this? If you've got the equipment, or the means of what you're doing, no matter whether it's going to mow grass or going and doing grading work, going working for somebody, building houses, deck builders, <laughs> make the decision and go do it because you never know if you're going to be successful until you try it. You've got to make that try to do it, just like we do in the fire service. You've got to try to get in there and make the save before you write it off. So get in there and try to do your best. That is fantastic advice. Thanks for being on the show, Tony. Yes, sir. Awesome. Thank you. We'll catch you later. See you. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. If you want to be on the show or you know someone who should, head over to the2448.com and submit your business. Don't forget to follow and subscribe and give us a five-star rating. If you thought it was four stars, still give us five stars or I will find you. See you next time. Later.